So there's a term that occurs in almost all textbooks, and the term is pistol. In general, I don't like the term pistol. I'm, I don't think we have a lot of time to go into why I don't like it. But you need to know about it because you're going to encounter it if you ever open a botany textbook after this or you ever try to key out a plant. They're going to say, pistol, pistol, what's a pistol? In essence, the pistol is the gynecium. So <clears throat> the pistol you'll see is, they'll talk about pistols in two different ways. Sometimes you will hear simple pistol, and sometimes you'll talk about a compound pistol. A simple pistol is when there is one carpal. So that first pea flower we looked at, that would be a simple pistil. A simple pistil is a flower with one carpal. A compound pistil is when there are many carpals, or I could say more than one carpal, let's just say many carpals, fused together. And so we've looked at a number of those drawings where we had compound pistils. Now that leaves us with cases like this. This is a strawberry or a raspberry, same thing. And that is neither a compound nor a simple pistil. It has, see here's pistil. That term pistil is there being used to mean one carpal. But then there are, in the flower, this whole flower has As many carpels, what does that mean? Many pistols? I don't know. The term is not defined well for those things. It's a mess, it's a messy term that I dislike. I never use it. We're not gonna you're never gonna see it on an exam or on another sheet in this class. I wanted to mention it to say that you're gonna encounter it if you use do anything else with plants, and you're gonna be confused by it. And that's right. That is the correct response. So you thought that you would be confused by it and there was something wrong with you, but no, there's something wrong with the botanist who wrote it. It does not make sense. I spent a long time trying to make it make sense to myself and I just finally said, this does not make sense. It really doesn't. The arrangement of the flower parts. and especially the arrangement of the flower parts relative to the gynecium. <clears throat> There's three, in general, three possible relationships. So if we look here, and see here, I'm gonna outline the gynecium in red in these cases. There's the gynecium. Here's the gynecium. The middle case is the most problematic. We'll do that last. And here is the gynecium. It's a little weird in this last case. Okay, so gynecium in red. I'll switch colors. The, the other flower parts in this first case of the parts are attached below the gynecium. See that? Here they are attached below the gynecium. So we say in this case that the flower is Hypo, below, gynus, female. But we don't say it hypogynous, we say hypogynous. So the flower is hypogynous, meaning that the flower parts are attached below the gynecium. 
of the ovary, we can say if the ovary then, well the ovary isn't below, it's above, so the ovary is superior. So our ovary superior and our flower hypogynous just shift the frame of reference. The flower is hypogynous, that means the flower parts relative to the ovary are below it. Ovary superior, that means that the ovary relative to the flower part is above. The other end of the spectrum is down at the right side, and in this case, the flower parts are attached above the gynecium. So here's the attachment of the flower parts at the blue arrow. You see that that ovary is below them. Now the style sticks up above them, but the ovary is below them, and that's really what we're concerned about here. So this flower is epi above the female, above the gynecium, epigynous. But of course we don't say it that way, we say epigynous. The flower is epigynous. The ovary is inferior. It is below. I'll use another color for the middle one. The middle one is the hardest one to understand. This is the only time I talked to my plant systematics professor the whole semester. He was actually my lab professor too. The only time I went into his office was to ask him, I don't get this middle one. What's this? Show me this middle one. And he drew me a little picture. I wish I still had it. He was a beautiful, he was really a great artist. He could do this little sketch that was just fantastic in about two seconds. I'm not sure I still understood it after he talked to me, but that was the only time I talked to him. I'm just saying, this is a little confusing. So first of all, let's look at the gynecium here. We see the gynecium, and now look at this little bit of tissue here. There's this tissue. It's not sepals or petals. What is that? Little green tissue. It's something else. And we give it a special name. It's a little cup, and we call it below the flower, hypanthium. So that is the hypanthium, hypo, anthium, flower, below the flower. So that hypanthium here is surrounding the ovary. So let's look at the position where the flower parts are attached. Flower parts attached around the gynecium. So this, old, this flower then is called peri around gynus and we pronounce that periginous. So it's the periginous flower. Now, there is, an, there is a, another possibility for to be, how to be periginous. To show you the other possibility, I'm gonna have to erase gynecium in red, because I'm gonna draw it up here. I'm gonna draw the gynecium again. So just a very simple gynecium, like that. I'm going to now draw in green the hypanthium. The hypanthium, in this case, I'm going to make, it's going to be fused. See, it's fused there to the ovary. So that's the hypanthium. Let's, we want to draw my flower parts in there, and I'll just grab a gray here to put them in. So here's the other flower parts coming off, okay? There we are, other flower parts. The other flower parts are still attached around the ovary. It's still periginous. 
But now the position of the ovary, this ovary is half inferior. So that ovary is half inferior. This ovary down here is superior. It's completely free of the other flower parts. You see down here, all the flower parts are attached around the ovary in the epigenous case. So in the perigenous case, there's two possibilities. The hypanthium can be free of the ovary, the ovary is superior. The hypanthium can be fused to the ovary to various extents, the ovary is half inferior. If the hypanthium, or maybe not even the hypanthium, if you have this case where the flower parts are, so to speak, fused all the way through the ovary, it's not perigenous, it's now epigenous. So those are our three arrangements of flower parts. And you have a chance to review those in lab. Here's the perigenous case again, since it's a little confusing. What color should I use? This is a rose. Here is the young flower. These are sepals and petals, but what you really want to look at here is a carpal, there's a carpal. Here is the carpal developed into a fruit. That technically here is the fruit. Or, yeah, that is fruit. It's a, all, roses have very unusual kinds of fruits. The hypanthium here, there it is, the hypanthium. in the flower, and here it is, the hypanthium in the fruit. And this flower is perigenous. These are actually called rose hips. The fruits of the flower of the rose are called rose hips. And they make delicious tea, so it needs a little sugar in it because it can be kind of bitter. But go down to one of the Whole Foods markets and you can buy rose hip tea and try it. And one of the, if you ever drink herbal teas and the tea looks red, there are two reasons for a tea to be red like that rose hips and hibiscus flowers. Those are the two staples of it in there. So you can find some dried rose hips. Flowers, we've talked about already, can be uh, monoecious or dioecious. I'm just going to see yep, what my next one is. Uh, they can be unisexual or bisexual. Plants can be monoecious or dioecious or perfect. Flowers can be unisexual or bisexual. This is a case of a unisexual flower. There's the flower. This is the female flower. Here's the male flower. This is willow. The genus name is Salix. And really what I want to talk about here is that these unisexual flowers are arranged in clusters. So here is a flower cluster. And the technical name for a flower cluster is an inflorescence. So not only unisexual flowers, but all flowers can be arranged in clusters. And the technical name is inflorescence. So, a, and the definition for an inflorescence is very simple, unlike the definition for a flower. An inflorescence is just a modified shoot system that serves for the formation of flowers. A German wrote this, that's why it's not really in English. A modified shoot system. We could say that bears flowers he said that serves for the formation of flowers. It's a very, very broad definition. Basically, it means it's a flower cluster. It's a group of flowers on an axis. 
Flowers not only can be in clusters, they can be born singly. This is a solitary flower. This is Liriodendron um, tulip tree. I won't try to write Liriodendron up here yet. And you can find the tepals, the stamen, and the gynecium. Relatively easy, very large flowers. Here is another flower cluster. This is a, the plant lizard tail. Sururus is the name of this. It's a plant of wet, wet areas. And so that's the inflorescence. And it almost looks like a flower. The inflorescence almost looks like a flower. It's a little weird looking flower. But down here, that's a flower. In fact, we have cases like sunflowers where we have false flowers. We have inflorescences that look like flowers. We are really much farther behind than I would like to be. Let me just tell you here a little bit about the male side, and then we'll try to do a little more on the female side of this. Here's the anther. Here's a microspore. Here is a tetrad. Remember what a tetrad is. There are tetrads of microspores. Actually, this is not a microspore. This is a microsporocyte. Microsporocyte, and that undergoes meiosis. There's meiosis to produce a tetrad. Here's the microspores. Here's the pollen grain. It's tiny in these cases, sometimes only two cells. And out of the pollen grain, we get the pollen tube. And just let's jump way down here. Here's the pollen grain. Here's the tube. And it is delivering the sperm to the ovule. We'll talk more about that in a second if we have time. We'll do it Thursday, if not today. When we look at the anther, so here's a cross section of an anther, actually two cross sections of anthers, we find that there are four microsporangia. So there are pollen grains, microspores or pollen grains in each of those. There is a place between them that is called the connective, that connects the microsporangia. There's a lot of other terminology here that we're not going to be concerned with in this class. Connective again, this is an open anther, or, yep, an open anther. And you can see that the two adjacent microsporangia fuse together to form a pollen sac. And there is an opening, or a place where it splits. And again, there's technical names for all of that we're not going to be concerned with. Just the basic idea that our microsporangia fuse together, and then the anther opens and sheds the pollen. Here's a tetrad of microspores. Here's a microspore. A bunch of microspores separated now from the tetrad. You know that they're microspores and not pollen grains because there's only one cell. So cell division has not taken place in there. We have no microgametophyte yet. See that in the next, well, almost in the next one. Here is a, another tetrad. There's one, two, three, four pollen grains. And you can also see that there's elaborate sculpturing on the pollen grains. And 
I don't have time. Maybe Thursday I can tell you what that's about. Here are the pollen grains. They are very small. They are shed at the two to three cell stage. Here is the tube cell, or the tube nucleus, I just call it the tube cell and the generative cell. And the generative cell is going to divide to form the sperm. This shows development again. We're not going to be concerned about the process of development. Here's a microspore. So all of this doesn't concern us. Here's a pollen grain. And here's a three-celled, that's two-celled, here's a three-celled pollen grain. And it can be shed at the two or three-celled stage. After the, after the <clears throat> pollen tube grows out, the gametes move down that pollen tube and will be delivered to the ovule. The ovule, that's, we're gonna look at the female side now. It's got two integuments, we're really out of time. And we're gonna skip all the details on this from this diagram and go to the next one and just refer you to this and say that the female gametophyte is seven-celled and it's got three kind of divisions of those cells. It's got three at this end, it's got three at this end, and it's got one central cell here. Three, six, seven cells. And they all have, well, not all, but most of them have special functions, and we'll talk about that on Thursday, and I'll figure out something we'll do in my lab in a minute. Okay, we wanted to look at the female side of reproduction in the anthophyta. We started with two integuments, and on the inside of those two integuments, and also shown here in the second diagram, we have the megasporocyte. So it hasn't undergone meiosis. Here's meiosis. We get four megaspores. Three degenerate. And here's the megaspore. And it is sometimes called the functional megaspore on this. So all of that detail is a little bit extraneous. What you just need to know, we have the same kind of things we would draw in the life cycle. You have a megasporocyte, it undergoes meiosis, you get a megaspore. You don't have to know about that these degenerate. I'm just explaining the diagram. The megaspore then is going to develop into the megagametophyte. And the megagametophyte is called in the anthophyta the embryo sac. And we're going to look at the structure of the embryo sac in just a minute. This is the this shows the process of the formation of the seed after fertilization, and we're just going to skip that for this class. So the what we're seeing here then is the embryo sac, and that's a down here also. There again is the embryo sac. In the context of the ovule, and as we said last time, the pollen tube is going to grow down into that ovule through the micropyle. Okay, so it grows into the micropyle. pile. 
Okay, so let's start looking at the embryo sac. We're actually gonna draw it out in a minute on the next slide. So we're just gonna kind of do an overview here. Again, you see the two integuments. And you can see the different parts of it. Now the female gametophyte here, the embryo sac, as we've said is got seven cells, so there are three antipodal cells. I'm going to draw my integuments a little differently so I can have three antipodal cells there. Those are the sterile cells, the prothallial cells, if you will. There is an egg at the center, at the other end, down near the micropyle. Next to that egg, there are two other cells. I hope you can see that that's purple. And these are called synergids, two synergids. They work with the egg to accomplish fertilization. In the very center, and not shown very clearly, because it doesn't show the cell membrane, I'm gonna draw in the cell membrane. There is a central cell. That central cell doesn't have a name, but there are nuclei in it, and there are two polar nuclei, so that cell is N plus N. So we have, in this case, seven cells, eight nuclei. One cell, that central cell, has two nuclei, N plus N. Really a weird situation for a higher plant. Our second diagram on this page, and I'm gonna use different colors for this, or a different color, so you see it's a little later. This shows the process of double fertilization. So you can see down here, we have a synergid and a sperm nucleus. And what's happened, and I'll draw this out again, is that the pollen tube has fused with the synergid. And I'm going to even say it this way, pollen tube delivers the sperm to the synergid. The synergid then cleans the sperm. So it's a works with the uh, works with the egg, I guess, to accomplish fertilization. And so it's going to pass one of the sperms over here to the egg. So let me grab a little boy color and. Here is one of our sperm. There's the pollen tube coming in. We delivered one sperm then to the egg, and the other sperm is going to be delivered up here to that central cell. So we're gonna get our two fertilization events, another color again. So there's the first and the second fertilization event. The first one is going to produce the embryo. And the second one is going to produce a triploid, 3N, tissue. We'll learn the name of that tissue in a minute. Egg down here, diploid embryo, and a triploid tissue in the center, really weird triploid tissue. Let's do that all again, drawing out the embryo sac. And I've forgotten the colors I used already. Well, I didn't use an out external color. I'll just pick something here. So 
there is our embryo sac. In red, you can draw in another color around it. I'll just choose a gray color here. Our integument. And we're drawing this now in the same way that we've, we're drawing it in the same way as up here, right? So integument is going to be down, pointing down where the regular micropile is going to be pointing downwards. So this is the integument. At the end opposite the integument, we have our three antipodals. So antipodals, they are meaning against, anti-against, hold foot. So against the foot. So it means it's not at the micropylar end, it's at the attachment end of the, well, there's a special name for this little stalk that comes down here, we're not gonna learn it, but it's at where that stalk attaches. So it's opposite the micropylar, it is against the foot. So if you think about the ovules, we've been often drawing the ovules upright so that if we haven't, whoops, I'm drawing a micropile up here, ovule like this. Not my very best diagram, is it? I think it's one of my worst. Let's try that again a little bit. There we go, that looks a lot better. And again, here would be our three antipodals. And you can see when we draw the ovule this way, and both kinds of ovules occur in angiosperms, if you are in different groups. We draw it this way, you can see there's the foot, the cells are next to the foot, and that's why they're called antipodals, next to the foot. At the other end, we have our two synergids. And what color was my egg? Red. And in the center, we have the egg. Now in the very center cell, and when you look in textbooks, this cell membrane is almost never drawn in. We're gonna draw it in though to make it very explicit. There is our center cell with our two polar nuclei. And that's the embryo sac, the megagametophyte. Now, the megagametophyte is surrounded by the integuments. Remember, what's the ploidy of the integuments? What's the ploidy of all of this stuff in here? Let's just talk about the nuclei. Yes, N is right for the nuclei. And then if you have to talk about the cells, you've got to say which cell? The egg is, the silicon is, the central cell is, and plus N, and the antipodals are. So this is the, this is the standard student embryo sac. I say it's the student embryo sac because it actually does occur in some angiosperms, but there are a lot of variations on this. So many variations that you wouldn't even recognize an embryo sac if you, st if you started looking, you wouldn't recognize the variation as an embryo sac if you looked at the, how it was constructed. But this is the one we're gonna learn with and it's a really good, uh, it's a good starting point. Let's talk a little bit about how the pollen, or the sperm, gets down to that embryo sac. And so we know that the pollen is born in the anther. Let's make that even more explicit. Pollen grains in microsporangia. In the anther, 
and the anther is the microsporophyll. The pollen grain is shed, and almost never is it shed in this way. It isn't shed from this anther to this plant. It happens. There's never, you can never, <coughs> everything happens. Any variation you can think happens in some move of the angiosperm. But this is rare. This is very rare. And there are a lot elaborate mechanisms, in fact, to prevent this, to prevent pollen from the same flower getting on the stigma of that flower. So it's not accurate, the diagram is not accurate. There's actually mechanisms to prevent pollen from a flower on one plant from getting, getting to a stigma on a different flower on that same plant. And just think about the gymnosperms. No flowers there, of course, but remember in Pinus, where we had the male pollen cones are low on the plant, the female are high on the plant. It's a mechanism for preventing pollination and fertilization within that same plant because in order to get the pollen up there, you gotta get really weird wind currents that were gonna swirl around and go upwards. Wind doesn't usually go up like that. Not impossible, but it's more difficult. So there are mechanisms that prevent pop, transfer of pollen within a plant or within a flower. But there is pollen that's transferred. It can be transferred by lots of different vectors. We'll see a picture of an insect next time. So insects, these are pollinators. Insects, water, that's rare, but it happens. Wind is very common within the angiosperms. Mammals, um, bats, for instance, in the tropics are very important pollinators. Not as much around here, but in the tropics, they're very important pollinators. Um, gosh, name something. Birds are incredibly important. Insect, we said insects, beetles, you name it. There is some plant that uses that. If it can move a little bit of dust around, it plant, some plant has exploited that, that pollinator. There are some fantastically elaborate mechanisms for this. And if you'd like to explore that, just go on YouTube and Google um, pollination by orchids. You'll see some really weird mechanisms of that. There are, there are orchid flowers that mimic the sexual organs of insects. And the male insects come in and try to copulate with the orchids. And they pick up the pollen from that and go into another flower. So it's, it gets really incredible how insects and flowers have evolved together to accomplish this pollen. During this, part, this movement of pollen, Wasp. And often it's, there's these wasps associated with the orchids. Um, so the pollen lands and it grows down. That's the pollen tube growth. And it grows into the micropyle. And there it's going to deliver the sperm to the synergid. Here's the pollinator. Yes? Does it deliver only to one of the synergid cells? Yes. Well, there can be multiple pollen tubes that come down there. It's actually an interesting question whether they actually all make it into the ovule like that. This diagram shows them all making it, number making it into the same ovule. I'm not sure. Yeah, that is. I think that there's a lot of um, selection that takes place before those pollen tubes get down there. And it may be that only one enters each ovule. I'm not positive about that. Here's a pollinator. This is insect pollination. We've talked about that before. Here is the pollen. There is the stigma. It is stuck right into that pollen mass. And then here's the anthers. 
And so you see when that bee backs out of the flower, it's gonna push its back across those anthers and pick up the pollen from that flower. So it didn't pick it up on the way in, it had pollen there from another flower, it's gonna pick it up on the way out and then transfer it to another flower. This is a, a relative of the pea a flower. Our pollen grain then ends up on our stigma. And there is an elaborate communication that takes place between the pollen grain and that stigma. Remember there was some sculpturing on the pollen grain, those elaborate um, well, sculpturing on it. And <clears throat> those sculptures are a, a way of holding material, um, proteins and lipids that are secreted by the anther. And then when that stuff, when the pollen lands on the stigma, there's interactions between those proteins and lipids that are on, on the surface of the pollen and the stigma. And that determines whether there's gonna be germination of the pollen tube or not. If it's, a com it's called a compatible mating or compatible transfer um, of pollen, and if that happens, there's a pollen tube produced. So what I'm saying is there actually is mate choice in plants. Plants don't just, there's not indiscriminate mating here. And one of the main places, not the only place, that whole thing about pollinators and whether they're gonna mate with the flower or stuff, that's mate choice also. But there's another level of mate choice at this level where the pollen lands on the stigma and that pollen tube may not grow. Or if it's a less than completely compatible mating, it may grow but grow slowly so that the ones that are more compatible grow faster. So thanks. There's a there's really interesting stories about this. You know, I do I have time to tell them? I don't know. Um, I won't, I'm not gonna tell you this, the stories, but I just say this, I to, I'll tell you this much. I used to serve on the women's studies committee in at the university and um, it's now women's and gender studies. And my story was gonna be about women and gender studies with this pollen tube growth. There's, and there are interesting stories about that. About, well, no, I, that would tell you the story. Ask me some other time. Okay, so here's the embryo sac. Can you see that blue on there? Reasonable. Here's the pollen tube gonna be coming in. And so the sperm now are gonna come in. And what this is showing is actually the process of double fertilization. So we have one sperm here. And it's harder to see the other sperm, but you can see there are two nuclei down there. And so there's a sperm here. Um, let me try another color here to write. So here is, let's just use the same terminology first, fertilization. Here's the second fertilization. So this is the embryo sac actually showing double fertilization. So we're gonna end up here then on this side with a diploid nucleus and up here in the center cell with a triploid nucleus. The diploid nucleus, of course, is gonna go on in the cell, this diploid there is gonna go on and form the embryo, and the triploid is gonna go on and form a new tissue that exists only in this group, only in this, these angiosperms. Come back, we're gonna come back to that name in just a second, just look at exactly the same thing, but we'll now look at it in a diagram. So there's our pollen tube. And here is one sperm cell. There's the other sperm. Um, I don't know what short color to use. Here's a synergid. Should be using purple.
And you can see the pollen tube is growing into the spinner jet, and it has then delivered the two sperm nuclei, one to the egg and one to that central cell. We see at the other end the antipodal cells, and you notice here there are more than three. So here's already we see one slight variation on what we've learned. We'll just label them antipodal cells. So we're going to use the th number three for the number of antipodal cells, even if our diagram in this case shows more than three. So if you had to say how big is an embryo sac, it would be seven cells, eight nuclei. Okay, here, here's the tissue that comes from this. Here's our seed. So this is a seed. And let's look at the embryo first. We'll start at the beginning, and we can find the parts of the embryo. Remember, we're going to draw our lines along here and look at the attachment of the cotyledons and the approximate place where the, where the root would be, root apex would be. So the bottom would be the radical. The middle section would be the hypocotyl. The cotyledons would be at the top. And then above those cotyledons, attached above those cotyledons, would be the epicotyl. And you could call it the plumule if it had a little more plumule-ness to it, a little more feather-like when there were some leaves produced there. Moving out from that, we find a tissue that comes from the central cell. There is a triploid tissue called the endosperm. So this is from the N plus N cell plus the sperm, which is also N, and that forms the endosperm. Endo, inside, sperm, seed. So it is the tissue inside the seed. It is a triploid tissue. You know this tissue. My class be quiet. What is this tissue? You know it. You have tasted it. You have watched, what was that movie, Pandora Planet, um, James Cameron's big movie? What? Avatar. You've watched Avatar while eating this. It is popcorn. Yes, popcorn. The, pop, the white center inner part of corn is triploid. It is the endosperm. You're never going to eat it again. <laughs> I, I want it. You don't like it? I love popcorn. I make myself sick eating popcorn. That's it. So the endosperm is that triploid tissue. It is a nutritive tissue that's, that supports the embryo. It doesn't occur in all angiosperms, but we'll come back to that point in a minute. But right now, we're going to consider it, it, it always is produced. Let's say that it's always produced in every angiosperm, and in this diagram, it is shown as a large tissue. So there's endosperm. They are triploid tissue. So in the gymnosperms, the nutritive tissue is the gametophyte. In the angiosperms, the nutritive tissue is the endosperm. So it's a different. In the gymnosperms, the nutritive tissue is the gametophyte. Remember, we've learned about the gametophyte before. And in the angiosperms, it's the endosperm, the tissue that nurtures, nurtures the embryo. So remember, if this, was the, if this was a diagram of a gymnosperm seed, and the diagram could look almost exactly alike, the word endosperm wouldn't be there. It would say megagametophyte. Um, it would, yeah, megagametophyte. We outside that we find the megasporangium. The megasporangium. This is all really kind of a fiction. Whether you know the megasporangium, if it's there, it's like one layer of cells. It can be there, but it is very very small. In other cases, it's all it's been it's been absorbed already, so it's it's very insignificant, a very insignificant part of the seed. But if you were to draw a seed, it's not a bad idea at this stage of learning to draw it in. And then on the outside, we have the seed coats, 
and they come from the, the integument, integuments. Because in the angiosperms, there's normally two. Okay, so here's some seeds. We're not gonna look at this picture at all. That's a picture about development. And we're gonna start by highlighting the endosperm in these two seeds. This first one is something like a bean seed. It's not a bean, but we will, it's similar to. And the endosperm is only around the outside. What's inside is the embryo. The embryo in this case is very large. So this is when I was saying there's little embryo, em, endosperm here. And in fact, I, I've exaggerated by the width of that line, I've exaggerated how much endosperm is there. Here's corn. Here is the endosperm of corn. Everything, all of this is endosperm. I hope that's showing up okay up there. This big nutritive part there. This is what pops in popcorn. This is what, when you eat a corn kernel, I love corn on the cob too, and there you go, and you're eating that delicious corn, and this is the part you're eating, endosperm. So where's the embryo? I use green, does that show, is that enough difference to see? It's hard to find a nice transparent color that you can both see through and yet is dark enough. So there, that whole central part is the embryo. Over here on the, let's see it's coming out blue on my screen. This is the embryo. So that's the main thing we want to see on this picture, the, dif the different proportions of the seeds in these two cases that are embryo. Now actually there's a important thing I need to say. This is not a seed. This is a corn fruit. And this is a seed over here. And we will talk about why this thing here is a fruit in just a minute. We're gonna come back to that when we talk fruit. So those corn kernels you've been eating, those are not seeds, those are fruits. So when you have a corn on the cob, you have a whole bunch of fruits stuck together on an axis. And like we say we have an inflorescence, we call those infructescences. And I'm not gonna write it here because we don't need another term. My point is that the corn, each of those corn kernels is a fruit. And we'll come back to why it's a fruit in just one minute. I wanna get onto the fruits. What, we should, what you should do on your own, draw a seed and label its parts. And it can be like that drawing, we, the first drawing, right? A really simple seed where You've got the embryo in the center and you're drawing and you're labeling the part. So very similar to this. That's what I mean by draw C. Make sure you can draw those parts and you know what order they're in. You know the parts of the embryo and you know that there's triploid endosperm in there. Okay, fruits. We've got plenty of time, I think, to talk about fruits. So we're gonna divide, we're gonna use a very simple fruit classification system. We'll make it a little more elaborate in lab, but still we're gonna to try to keep it relatively simple. Fruit classification is very complex because, probably because there's so many angiosperms, people have made terms for fruits that apply only to one small group of angiosperms. For instance, what the, there's the rose family. And in the rose family, we have apples. Apples are a member of the rose family, the genus Malus. And the fruit of that genus is given a special name. It's, the name only applies to the fruit of apple. It's not, the name, the technical name is not apple. It only applies to them because, it, because apples are so commercially important, there are people whose whole 
professional life is spent studying apples and the breeding of apples. And so those things are called poems. What's a poem? It's the fruit of the genus Malus, and that's it. There is no other group that has a poem besides that. So we're not going to go into that kind of detail. There's other group. There's lots of other examples like that. Like the poem is actually pretty easy. It's kind of a cool word, you know. And you can now, now that you know it, you can go and talk to your parents or your friends or something and say, "Oh, you got a nice poem there." Can I have a bite of that poem? Is it spelled like P O M E? P O M E. So there's another one, that, uh, a, um, an orange. There's a special name for the oranges. Again, really, really important commercial things. But it's not just oranges. It's oranges and lemons and kumquats. And all of those things are called Hesperidians. It's a little more complex name. So we're not going to do, we're not going to spend a lot of time on those. I've spent about as much time as I am going to on those technical names. And <clears throat> you'll do a little bit about them in the lab, but you'll have the sheets there to, so you can learn a couple of those names. But they're not, important for, they're not important for us and shouldn't appear on the exams. You're not going to be asked to say, what is the name of a root? What is the technical name of an apple? We're going to divide these things into dry fruits and fleshy fruits. There's several types of dry fruits. Two of the most important types are the legume and the capsule. There's really one type of fleshy fruit. Now, there's all the kinds of types of fleshy fruits, if you get into the terminology. But for us, we're going to talk about one main type of fleshy fruit, and that's the berry. Almost all fleshy fruits, in fact, I think all fleshy fruits in this class, we're going to call a berry. We may talk a little bit about one subtype, and that is called a, a droop. A droop is a subtype. And in fact, this picture shows a young droop. What's a droop? A droop is a stone fruit, a fruit like a peach or a plum. So those fruits have fleshy out exteriors, but they're not fleshy all the way through. An example of a berry that is not a droop would be a tomato. Tomato is a very typical berry, fleshy, fleshy all the way through. You can eat the whole thing. A, a droop, a stone fruit, you can eat that fleshy outer part, but you get down in there and you break your teeth. That part you break your teeth on is actually part of the fruit wall. It's not the seed, it's part of the fruit wall. And you can do this now. Next time you get a stone fruit, take it outside with a hammer, but there's a little suture, a little, yeah, um, a little breaking point along it. It doesn't break easily, but if you whap that with a hammer just right, you can break the thing open and you'll find the seed inside. Both the cat legume and the capsule are dehiscent, which means opening. So dry fruits can be dehiscent or indehiscent. Most fruits that we're going to see are dehiscent. Most dry fruits are dehiscent. Not all. Most dry fruits are dehiscent. We will learn a couple more dry fruits besides the legume and the capsule, one main one. So dehiscent opening fruits. Both legumes, peas, if you, or beans, if you let them dry out enough, if you grow them on your, grow them outside and on your bean plants and you let them dry out and don't harvest them, they will usually eventually split open. So here is a capsule. So this is a dry fruit. This is a capsule. And you can see in this capsule that we have three carpels. And if we had axial placentation, here would be our ovules, our seeds at this stage. Seeds would have been here. They've been shed from the capsule already. And so you can see it is a dehiscent fruit. It's opened up to shed those seeds. Corn. Come back to corn. This is another dry fruit. This is our third type of dry fruit. It is called a grain. And it, the reason it's called a grain is because all of our grains, so it's not just corn, it's wheat, rye, um, 
How do you spell Rye? R Y. Um, oats. I mean, etc. Just everything. All the grains have this same structure, and so the structure of a grain is that this outer wall, this yellow wall here, that is the fruit wall. And that fruit wall is fused to the seed coat. So the fruit wall is fused to the seed coat. You can't tell them apart. You'd have to take a section of them, make those sections like we have in class, and then you could very diff with difficulty see that there's two distinct layers there. So you know the, about this because you know the difference between brown rice and white rice. Brown rice is the whole grain. It's got all of those seed coats and the ovary wall on it. And white rice, all of that stuff is stripped off and what are you left with when you have white rice? What's the nutritive tissue? Endosperm. White rice is pretty much pure endosperm. Well, it is pure endosperm and endosperm is pretty much pure starch. And that's why with white rice, you cannot, you cannot sustain life on white rice. So there are, you know, again, interesting stories about that. You can look up um, stories about uh, beriberi and the discovery of why, what the disease beriberi was caused by. Basically, it's a nutrient deficiency. White rice in the Far East was fed to prisoners in, in jails for, I don't, God, I don't know how long, hundreds of years, and they would develop, the, the, pre, the prevalence of beriberi in those jails was very high. Finally, Engl the, when the English came in and did all their bad stuff in the Far East, they did some few good things and they brought doctors in and tried to figure out why the prisoners were getting this disease. And they figured out it was a nutrient deficiency because they were fed on a diet of solely white rice, nothing else but white rice, and you can't live on it. I, I've said probably too much about that already. It's another fascinating story you can uh, look up about human nutrition and plants and, and endosperm. So our point here is that these dry fruits or the grains are consist of this. And I've been trying to think of the other word of the grain. What's the other name for grain besides grain? It's not caryopsis. It's it is caryopsis. Then what am I thinking is the other one? So it's caryopsis also. See, this is why I teach my section first, so they can come in and they can help me out. Grain is a caryopsis. I'm fine with you calling it a grain. You don't have to learn caryopsis. But you might see that term some places. It means the same thing, a little more technical name for grain. Grain is actually a technical name here. So a corn is a fruit, a fruit, and the when you have a corn cob, you know the silk from the corn cob. What's that silk? It's the style and the stigma. And so if you look at the corn cob we have in lab, and now it's mature now, so you got not don't have flowers there, you've got the you got the fruits, so it's hard to see. But if you follow those down, it's gonna run down to the bottom of those corn kernels. Each one run one runs to one corn kernel, and the pollen grains had, had to draw go through all of that go through through all of that silk to get fertilization to deliver their sperm. Here's a berry like tomato, it's a fleshy fruit, completely fleshy. It's fleshy and indehiscent. There's no real way that fleshy fruits can open, right? They're fleshy and they don't have a way to split open when they dry out, because they don't dry out. So tomato is a perfect example of that. And this is like a, there it is, like a persicum is the genus for tomato. Here's a, um, this is a droop and a poem. We're not caring too much about poem, but our main point here is that these are, are berries. A berry, two different types of berries. The stone fruits you see, <clears throat> here is the <coughs> fruit wall. And it's got three parts. The parts, now you know enough in Greek to know how to interpret these names. Exocarp 
meso part, meso you might not know, it means middle. I think we did meso, meso already. And endocarp inside. And the endocarp, this is the stone. So the in part, and then there's the seed at the very center. We'll crack that open to find that. The poem on the other side, this other kind of berry, it's just a fleshy fruit. I'm not going to go into any more detail about it than that, but you can see here are the five loctules, which means there were five carpels. And you'll see a cross section like that in lab. Okay, two more types of fruits and we're done. We'll just finish up. This is an aggregate fruit. So this is a type of compound fruit. So there's gonna be two types of compound fruits. Aggregate fruit, a strawberry. Here is a, this is the gynecium or a carpal. That's one carpal. Here are lots of carpals. So that is one flower, now becoming one fruit, one aggregate fruit. I'm just going to write one fruit. But there are many carpals that are free on the surface of that. And we have here this part, the delicious part of the strawberry, love strawberries too, is um, stem. It's receptacle. So it's part of the receptacle tissue. So an aggregate fruit comes from one flower, but it's got many carpels on it. And each of those carpels, this is one seed. Actually, it's not even just a seed. I'm sorry, I just wrote that wrong. Each of those, it technically is a fruit, right? It's a developed carpal with a seed inside of it, right? The ovule would be inside here. I'm not sure how to draw the ovule on here. Ovule. So it's kind of a weird situation, right? You've got these individual little fruits, except they're all held together in one flower. That's why we call it an aggregate fruit. The other kind of compound fruit, here's the last one. is called a multiple fruit. There's two examples, pineapple. And this one, I don't know if you'll be able to see, this is mulberry. In this, here, that's a flower. This is a flower. Well, they're fruits now. This, here, that's a bract. So in the axle of every bract, we have a flower, we have, in other words, an ovary, that's become a fruit. So this was one flower, one flower, one flower, one flower. They're all held together on an essential axis. So this thing, this pineapple, which you think of as a fruit, is really a whole bunch of fruits held together. In other words, it's a multiple fruit. A corn cob is actually the same kind of thing. We don't usually call a corn cob a multiple fruit, and there's no good reason for that, but it is. It's exactly like this. I guess because we call corn vegetables, not fruits. I don't know. We are over time. This is mulberry is the same way. There's a central axis. Each of those into ones are fruits. And I can let you go. This was it. That was my last slide. You're going to see those in class in lab. If you're not clear on them, that's the right thing to think right now. Look at them in lab and figure out the difference between a multiple and an aggregate fruit. This is one of the few things you really have to memorize in this lab class because there is no good way to understand the difference between aggregate and multiple except to memorize them.